seminary in 2004, um, I had assumed when I entered that I, I have an education background. So um, I thought it was just a natural thing to do uh, to study Christian education. Um, but while I was there, I felt called uh, to ordain ministry, mostly because I, in my experience, I had not seen Asian American ordained women before. And uh, that was, that was, uh, that was really, um, I guess, not just eye-opening, but like, I, if you don't, if I didn't see it, I didn't know I could be it, right? Like, so, so um, I was really, um, oh, hi, <laughs> we, we have one person on mine. <laughs> Glad you're here with us. Um, yeah, so I think I felt called when I was at Princeton. Um, then we had a baby. <laughs> so that kind of just put the put the put, um my call on hold for, for quite a while. Um we raised three babies. Um and uh during the pandemic, I finally thought it was my turn. <laughs> um my kids were a little old enough to to be independent. Um um, but I had never forgotten. I'm just like, why did God call me then <laughs> um, and made me wait? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but but I I do understand um, now that I needed all this time and the life experience and um, uh, to and stories <laughs> um, to to understand what God is calling me into. Um, so, um, I do a lot of intersectionality work, um, uh, I'm on the school board, <laughs> um, you'll see, you'll see later on, I'm on the school board and that's actually pretty time consuming, um, and, uh, um, well, I'll, I'll show you more a, li a little later, it'll, it'll scroll through, <laughs> I'll tell you about things I do. So, so let's question, um, this is a question I'd like to I like us to ask ourselves, right? Um, so I kind of titled it "Reimagining," reimagining what it is like to reimagine the image of God in our LGBTQ siblings. So, um, and this is the verse that I like you to just tuck in your head while we're going through all of all of um, all of this. Uh, yeah. So Genesis one twenty six twenty seven. Then God said, let us make humans in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans in his image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female, he created them. And that's the NRSV version. So at any point, if you want to, Ask questions. I love for this to be interactive. Um, just clarifying if I'm not making something clear. Please, please do so. So um, this is my firstborn. Um, my firstborn. This was very new infant. Um, that's that's uh, Tay um, helping to baptize our third um, holding baby. Um, and uh, and yeah, so. My firstborn was assigned male at birth, um, but she goes by Talis now. <laughs> and this is our story. This is our family in 2020, 2021. Um, she did a, a, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Camp Johnsonburg. Um, so she graduated during the pandemic in 2020 and um, took a gap year. Um, as an intern at uh, Kim Johnson Mark. So that was the graduation. So believe it or not, I think that was like the last time we took a, like a nice family picture together. <laughs> so that was what I have, but my youngest is as tall as me now. So, and he's, he's 13. Um, so my journey to my, the work that I do now, I feel like the journey to, <laughs> the journey to um, why God made me wait. <laughs> Um, this is, uh, my kid, my kid came out to us as a transgender person in April, 2017, when she was, um, 14, freshman year in high school. 
And I think it was during or like right around Easter time. And I knew that like for several years prior to that in middle school, through puberty, through um, it was it was a she struggled a lot mental health wise. Just when she was younger, um, she was really bubbly and extroverted and had a lot of friends and did a you know played all the sports. Um, but then middle school puberty came around and she became very withdrawn. Um, and you know we went through a couple of years of pretty scary times that I didn't, I just wanted my kid to survive into adulthood at that time. <laughs> and that was, that was, um, yeah, that took a, yeah, we had some, we had some scary moments. Um, not to say that, you know, uh, she doesn't still struggle. She does, but, but I think, um, it's it's kind of why it motivated me and propelled me to do the work I do now. So between April and July, I'm just like, I didn't see this coming. How did I not see this coming, right? Like I didn't know. Um, and I didn't have a language. I didn't know people. Um, we didn't have proximity to, um, to the LGBTQ community, even though we had always been, um, we say we were affirming, we say we were accepting, um, but it wasn't very, it still wasn't very visible. Um, and I don't think my kids saw a lot of representation in her life, like in 2017 at that time. Um, and um, I think 2017, we're at the heels of like, you know, Trump just being elected. And I think in the first few months, um, I was really engaged in um, the being uh, being an advocate for for the immigration community because um, I think in the beginning of the year, the end of January was the beginning of the um, uh, the Muslim ban <laughs> um, for the countries, and so I'm just like so that was where I focused my energy, and then. Um, also trying to keep my kid alive. Um, and, you know, April came around and I'm like, I, I don't know about this. Like, I wasn't sure. And I felt like I needed time um, to figure it out. And um, and then three months later, <laughs> um, just through a tweet, um, there, you know, I think I remember I was driving um, and I heard it on NPR that, you um, uh, Trump had tweeted the military ban for transgender um, for transgender people in the military. Um, and I remember pulling over and pulling off the road and I just had to cry. And so because I realized then that my kid does not have time for me to get it. My kid does not have time for me to like, you know, to understand before, you know, because this world is no longer safe for my kid. And so, um, so I was thinking at 14, okay, so that means if in two, three years, when, if she wanted to join the military, she can't, <laughs> like she, she, she wouldn't be able to serve her country if she wanted to, you know? So, um, so I realized it's, it's, gotta pull myself up and uh, you know make sure that I keep working for a for a world that that my kid would be fully affirmed and fully accepted in. So so that was um that kind of activated everything. <laughs> um so uh reimagining uh Genesis um the Genesis passage. So what does it really mean um for us to be for every human to be created in God's image, who does that apply to and who does it include? So, you know, just questions that I like to think about, right? Um, what are some questions or concerns that most people are hung up on? Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I think the, the, the reason that some, um, 
<laughs> I feel like I feel like maybe sometimes um, the language, the understanding is still that you know this is a lifestyle and they choose this, right? This is somehow a choice. So, but why does it matter? <laughs> why does it matter in how we interact and how we affirm another human being? Um, what, regardless of whether we can be sure of that answer or not, um, we are all created in love, with love, um, by a God called love. Um, so how does how do we reflect that in the world, and how do we um, want others to be reflected, um, in especially in faith communities? Um, okay, so. These are some of the slides that I, I had um, created for a few other workshops, but this is just something, this is not a justification. Um, I don't want to justify and, and, and I don't want to like convince you, but, but just thoughts to, to think about, to, to, to think about, um, to reimagine what it, you know, our, our understanding of creation, right? So, so if we can, if we can just stop thinking, um, stop categorizing everything in binary terms, right? In, in either this or that. Um, but if we can get to a place where we can embrace both and, both are possible. Um, both and are all possible. Um, when, um, when the creation story tells us that God created day and night, we know that there's a span in between. It's not just day, it's not just night. Um, land and sea, there's all these spaces in between that are part of creation as well. Um, the sun and the moon, and of course, we, we know there's the universe and all that's within it. Um, and there's so much variations and variety and, um, uh, and beauty that's across spectrum. Um, why would male and female and why would gender and our sexuality be different, um, be the exception. And um, God said that, saw that everything that God had made and it was good. And he declared it, God declared it good. So um, I, I, I feel like oftentimes um, when we are afraid of um, the other that's different from us, we often have um, expect them to earn our acceptance and earn our, you know, they have to prove that they are just somehow deserving of our, um, of our uh, spaces and our, our, our policies to be affirming. But um, what if, what if, <laughs> what if the baseline is that we are affirming and um, that, that everyone is deserving of, of love and acceptance? Um, so reframing, reframing the binary understanding of, you know, and like we, we all exist on a spectrum somewhere because <laughs> I, growing up, I am not the most, you know, feminine girl. <laughs> like I, I, I was a tomboy. I hated wearing dresses, but I, my middle child is, I was so intent on raising my kids to be, to not, you know, to be more gender neutral, to play with gender neutral toys, to, you know, dress, to choose across um, the spectrum. Um, she is a total pink, sparkly princess, <laughs> like girly girl, like um, her first word I think was shoes, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> in Chinese is an easy, it's an easy sound, but like um her her yeah, she loved to put on my shoes. She came to my she, this was before she even knew how to talk. She put on one of my um, pair of heels. I never wear heels, it was just for church, really. Um and um yeah, that was her first word to to to, to me. She's like oh, where are these shoes? <laughs> Okay, so so we're on a, on a spectrum, um, and to to reimagine because our human um, our own characteristics are are we're, we're limited. We and and God is unlimited in God's imagination, love and mercy um, beyond boundaries, um, beyond cultures, beyond languages, gender and status. 
and beyond our own understanding. And this is all, um, you know, scripturally based. But humans, I, you know, from um, from someone who's, you know, who speak another language that does not have um, genderized pronouns, it was very, um, I felt, I felt like my understanding of humanity was more limited once I learned English, right? Mm -hmm. Because in Chinese, the word, there's a special pronoun for God, um, but it's pronounced the same. Unless you see a written, you wouldn't know. Like he, she, it, uh, not it, he, she, and God all have the same pronoun. Um, uh, in you know, uh, um, in in pronunciation, I guess. But you know, unless it's it's written, sometimes it's specified, sometimes it's not. Um, but but then in English, I'm like, okay, so if we assign certain, I mean, even if you're even if you don't know a person in a conversation, mm -hmm. um, and just by the usage of pronouns in that conversation you imagine you 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 know you place um characteristics your pre preconceived understandings of what the other person might look like or think like or you know uh, so so i think it's um language is very limited and god has existed before that right like so um pronouns translations and interpretations of scripture um these are these are um not always accurate right it's it's um often i mean biblical scholars here so you know like um we i think i think oftentimes um the different translations of scripture english translations are there's, there's so much variation as well right like and um yeah and I feel like it wasn't really until like I really studied Hebrew and Greek that I'm like, oh my gosh, but like what do we do with with the scripture? Because I'm like, this I don't think this is this says what we think it said. Um, and you know that all have influences from our culture and from you know <laughs> um, patriarchy and you know all of that. So. Um, as I understand, the word homosexuality was not inserted into scripture until 1946 in, uh, you know, in, in English, because um, the original um, words meant, it didn't mean sex, homosexuality. It, um, it, mo it was mostly, it was used in the, in the, to refer to abusive relationships between older men and younger, younger children <laughs> like younger men um so it was it, it described an abuse of power rather than um what we think it means now so so those are our our own limits and yet and then we place policies and rules on top of um on top of that to define who is worthy to be um, to have certain rights and who is deserving and who's accepted and who's not. Um, so in my, um, in, in my work, I've met a lot of young people um, who experience religious trauma. And, um, you know, most of them who identify as LGBTQ, you know, or in the, in the LGBTQ community, all have a story about how they felt rejected by God or by the people <laughs> in church who are supposed to um, supposed to love them. Um, but so that is that is what motivates me to continue to speak to folks like you. So um, yeah. yes, like yeah. Um, I'm just fascinated mm -hmm. with the observation that as you learned English, you learned mm -hmm. to, <laughs> to differentiate, mm -hmm. compartmentalize, and binary, and right. all of that. 
when you went back to begin to study Greek, Greek, Greek and mm -hmm. Hebrew, what was that perspective? Because I'm not a bit yeah. of a scholar in that sense. Yeah, that is that is, that is a great question. Um, I did talk about this before, but I don't remember if I have a slide about that. Um, but in the in the Old Testament, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. No, you know more <laughs> about this than I do. <laughs> For sure. But in the Old Testament, um, Greek. Uh, I'm sorry, in the Old Testament, Hebrew, the pronouns for Hebrew, uh, the pronouns for God in Hebrew was not always consistent. Um, it was he, but when we call God Elohim, that is a plural pronoun. And um, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm right, but you know, <laughs> The im at the end of the word it indicates a plural, pl plurality. Um, and when God is referred to as um, the spirit and wisdom in the Old Testament in Hebrew, it is referred to as a she. The pronoun is a feminine, not not she, but it's a fem feminine pronoun. So it's not a, it's not as consistent as it is in English. <laughs> so I feel like when we only exclusively use he for God, that takes away, that diminishes who God is um, in, in the fullness of who God is. Because then we're limiting, we're assigning certain characteristics and understanding to the he, then the fullness of the Yeah. So... Yeah. Question so far. Um, so this is some of the courageous reflection questions that I, you know, just I, I like it's just to keep in mind. So what are some of the boundaries to pay attention to, right? Like, so what are the boundaries defined by my culture, by society, by church, um, culture, family? I mean, by systems. Mm -hmm. Systems all have certain rules and, you know, um, defining um, defining how one is to behave in that in that system. Um, so, what are those boundaries? Is, are those boundaries meant to keep some people in and others out, or is it um, you know? Sometimes we just don't we just don't notice because we've always done it that way. We've always had that rule, right? Like we just don't pay attention to um, closely examine like like how does this still apply and and have people been systemically feel excluded by this rule and i like you to explore that i like you to explore signs like in the building like are they welcoming or are they do they make certain people feel like hmm, <laughs> i'm not sure where i belong or i'm not sure if i know where i should go um things like that um, do they increase my capacity of love or do they keep outsiders out and insiders in? Um, so when we're examining rules, policies, and laws, um, I think the question we should always ask is who, who benefits from this? Um, who's included? Who, who is harmed? Um, who, who gets to make the decisions? <laughs> um, so... And what has been my pattern when something new I learned no longer fits my paradigm? Mm -hmm. So do I do I run away? Do I just you know ignore it, or do I um, do I challenge myself to like work through that discomfort and to work through that fear? And to you know with educating myself and you know learning more about it, and um, because when my kid was um, so that year between 2017 and 2018, um, once I, I wouldn't even say that I, you know, it wasn't a fear. It wasn't a discomfort. I, we just did not have proximity to the LGBTQ community, like for people to, you know, for, for folks to, um, and I worry, right? Like, I, I mean, three months later, you know, the world was no longer safe for my kid. And I'm like, I, you know, I, 
I'm okay with however you are, whoever you are. But I just want you to be safe. Like, how do I, <laughs> like, you know, how do I, um, you know, worry about, you know, what college are you going to go to? And, you know, and I'm thinking about dorms and I'm thinking about like, you know, um, I couldn't imagine what it was going to be like in 10 years for her, right? Like I, I didn't know what that was going to look like. So I found API Rainbow Parents. Um, uh, it's it's a PFLAG chapter. Um, PFLAG is is a that is support group. It's it's has long traditions. Um, uh, I think they started in 1974 by a mom of a gay son. Um, it's uh, Parents, Friends of Lesbian and Gays. So that's the acronym. Um, it's, an, it's a national organization support, uh, but there's only two that, you know, I think there's a West Coast and an East Coast um, chapter that specifically focus on supporting Asian American families. So I, I found them by almost by accident, but I was also seeking community and seeking understanding and um, found my way to them. And, and then we had in 2018 in the spring, um, they had a Korean queer trans conference, KQTCon in New York City. I immediately signed up and then my kid was the youngest one there. And there was like all these like young adults in their twenties right? Like in their twenties who are successful, who, who went to college, you know, like who, who are finding themselves not without struggles, significant challenges. A lot of them are rejected by family, are rejected by their church, you know, and I'm just like, I want to adopt you all, you know, but, um, but then it was, it was that visibility. It was being part of that community, that I'm like, oh, I can see my kid in 10 years and she's going to be okay, you know? And so that was just, um, so that was, th that's the, that's the thing, new thing I learned um, through proximity. Um, and I, I feel like I just need to challenge you all to, to, to keep seeking for that, right? Like things that you don't understand, don't be afraid, but get close, get close to it. So, you know, um, so you understand. So, um, uh, some of these. Um, okay, so I think I used this slide um, before uh, with a with a group that was um, focusing on mental health um, side for uh, the LGBTQ community, and you know, so some of these things that we don't I I take I take for granted, and I say it's my it's my own gender privilege that I don't need to think about and. Um, I never have to consider. Um, so during 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 high school years for my kid, um, we I realized I had to think about like how long can we be out in a public space um, before she needs to use the bathroom, and where can I find a public one safely? So. So, I mean, those are things that I'm just like, I never had to think about that before, <laughs> right? Um, and in New Jersey, um, we every public school has a transgender student guideline policy um, that protects students, that's, you know, um, aimed to protect students. Um, but it doesn't mean that every school complies, <laughs> right? Or enforces it or anything like that. So, so... Um, I, I, I was kind of astounded that in 2017, when I asked the high school, um, do you have a gender, uh, do you have a, you know, gender neutral bathroom? Um, cause my kid was not comfortable using either at the time. And, um, she went by they, because that's how they presented. Um, and, um, at the, they were very supportive, but. It took them nine months. Um, seven months, seven of those months were during the school year. It took them nine months. And after like, you know, multiple times of uh, super friendly, very accepting, very supportive. But I'm like, how long does it take to slap a sign on the door? Mm -hmm. So for seven months, my kid didn't go to the bathroom at school. Mm -hmm. um, 
The other option was to go to the nurse's office, which, you know, is an, another form of othering because, you know, everyone else, you know, you have to ask the nurse, you have to go down to a, you know, to the corner of the building. And, um, and for seven months, she did, she didn't go unless it was absolutely necessary. So I feel like that is, that is, an, that's an issue that many, you know, um, gender diverse people struggle with. Um, very basic human need that we don't, we walk around never thinking about, about it, right? Um, so, so all of these things, um, so currently, um, I wanted to show you what is happening in the world right now, if you're still not aware. Um, there's a lot of you know, book bans. I don't know if you're hearing about that. Um, and uh, that transgender student protection policy that I'm telling you about, that all schools should comply with in New Jersey. Um, several districts in New Jersey just repealed that. Um, and the last one, the last one, it was just last week in Hanover. Um, <clears throat> Daniel Vigilante mm. spoke mm -hmm. against the overturning of that and, and spoke to us about it. Oh, wow. And he testified to the Hanover Board of Education. Yeah. That's, that's Was he there? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So Hanover, um, actually another district. Is this Sparta? I think it was Sparta. Sparta last week. Hanover was the week before. Um, Sparta, I mean, it was... I mean, if we're, we conduct our school board meetings very by the, you know, book of order, <laughs> not book of order, um, Robert's rules, <laughs> Robert's <laughs> rules, <laughs> right? Um, and this, and the board, I, I was watching because they, they, they had a, they, they streamed it. Um, no, I'm sorry. They put the video up after the meeting. So I was trying to figure out what happened. Um, but it was not on the agenda. It was, um, they closed the first public comments. Um, and then the president of the board said, before we move on to approve agenda items following, and that's on the agenda, um, I make a motion to repeal, <laughs> you know, um, policy 5756. And then I'm just like, what just happened? Because because I I had looked at their agenda before the meeting. I'm like, it's not on here. Like, what? Why? Why are we? Um, why are people showing up for this? Yeah. What is the gender neutral policy, and what is their reason for? We go to wanting to repeal. I actually have the link to it. Um. Their biggest concern, oh, oh, I'm not on the internet. Oops, I forgot. <laughs> um, their biggest concern, these are the uh, eight sections. The biggest concern is that, um, I have the link, so maybe I'll, I'll share it with you all later, mm -hmm. but um, the biggest concern is um, parents' rights. So I know, <laughs> parents' right to know. So I, I'm sure you've heard of the the Florida, don't say gay bill, and all you know all of that. That's just moving, <laughs> catching momentum and moving um, north. Um, so there is a large group in New Jersey that is activating. Um, it's really the arm of the Moms for Liberty in New Jersey, uh, the chapter, um, and they are running for school board. And so, so this is their, the, the, you know, the, I didn't include it in here, I don't think, but um, we want to talk about like parents' rights, right? It was rooted in the 1950s when white parents, um, when white parents uh, opposed the desegregation of schools. And then um, following the Brown versus BOE decision, and then this, the, these are how it was showing up in, in our, you know, in the world, <laughs> in, in vouchers for private schools, anti, and more, more the most recent um, 
you know, the, during the pandemic, anti-vax, anti-vaccine, anti-masking, um, questioning critical race theory, and all grew out of like the Don't Say Gay Bill in Florida and just catching momentum. Moms for Liberty had their first national conference in Philly last um, spring, uh, last last June, this past June. Um, and the New Jersey chapter, they're actually called Chaos and Control. Like, that's their name. <laughs> like, um, so they're all on, you know, social media and, and they come out with lists of endorsed candidates. Um, and, you know, I... I had done, I had created the slide for a PCUSA event um, on, on our responsibility, on Presbyterians' responsibilities in, um, in the public sphere, in public education. So, and different states are doing different things. They're focusing on different, um, different, overturning different kinds of policies. So, kind of pay attention to what is happening in your neighborhood. Um, but in New Jersey, it's definitely the book bans and the trans student policy. The trans student policy, um, again, they want to repeal, they want to repeal it based on um, the fact that they say it's parent, the parent's right to know if a child is uh, identifies as anything else other than you know, so if parents don't know that staff and the school has a responsibility to tell them that they must tell, but we know that that is not safe. And the practice and the and the um, policy was created by, um, you know, and and supported by educators, child psychologists, pediatricians, you know, like all child developmental experts, right? Like because we, um, for a whole host of reasons. The highest, um, the highest population of um, homeless youth identify as LGBTQ mm -hmm. because once their family finds out, they kick them out. And um, uh, and I, I mean, I have stories to tell about that too, <laughs> right? Like, um, and so family rejection, um, religious faith community rejection. Um, and that, that really impacts their own mental health because they're, I mean, I, I, and I think about my kid too, by the time that she was able to tell me at 14, she was already sitting with us for a couple of years. That's when we were dealing with like the symptoms of mental health um, that I thought that we're just dealing with anxiety, we're dealing with depression, you know, I'm like, we're up psychiatrists were on top of this but she was already sitting with this for a while even though we are an affirming family <laughs> so imagine kids who are not right who are not who don't feel safe at all um be, even being at home um yeah I'm, I'm slow but what is the policy that they're trying to they want they want they want um they want to repeal the entire thing, but they're um but, but the, the entire policy that the doing. policy um the policy provides uh it doesn't it, again it's it's a guideline it's it's schools are supposed to comply but uh, students are supposed to have access to facilities students are supposed to have like bathrooms locker rooms. Um, uh, students should not be prevented from playing sports. So my kid um, ran track on the boys team freshman year, but ran on the girls team the following two years. Um, and I, coaches were all super supportive. I was more afraid of other parents. So, That's but awesome. my kid is not the fastest kid, you know? <laughs> um, um, she never plays first, <laughs> you know, like it's, but of course, there's always that fear um, of how, how, you know, other parents will treat your kid. Um, and then I think, yes, I'm sorry. This is probably a yeah. question, but how did your, how did your daughter transition? Did she like stop having girlfriends and having, started no. hanging out with boys or how did, or did she just, did everyone just 
accept everyone at that point in time. Which yeah, happens. you know, in school, the kids don't care. That no, like this is not the kids don't care about this. Like they, they, they're you know, she still had the same kinds of friends, you know, in high school, I you know a lot of, a lot of times kids have different, you know, groups of friends, like mm -hmm. by the time they're in high school, they find their own people. <laughs> um, and, you know, social transitioning for her was gradual. Um, just going by a different name that the teachers will honor. And that was the policy too. That's in the policy that, you know, the record should show um, like on their official, official records, like it should still be their birth name. But um, in classes, you know, like it shouldn't be an issue for for um, teachers to pull up their record and, and see their preferred name, right? So. I have a question yeah. about the language. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your daughter is transgender mm -hmm. and you refer to her as she. Yes, because she was assigned male at birth. So um, if you use that pronoun, there really should be a different pronoun. Correct? No, she goes by she. Oh, okay. She okay. was she she went by they for the first few years. Um, and that was really hard for me because, you know, again, we're limited by our language, our understanding of language, right? Um, and uh, although <laughs> um, they was only used as plural, I mean, it was used for both, but for singular and plural for a longer periods of time than it's actually been used only exclusively as plural. So, um, so yeah, they, they went by they. So by the time I finally got used to the day and stopped making mistakes, she went by she. <laughs> and I'm like, ah. Okay, but that's yeah. The policy though is the is the real sticking point requirement that parents be notified mm -hmm. when what when it's obvious or when the child tells the school what's the so in uh, oftentimes when when um. Kids are, you know, uh, queer kids are growing into themselves. Um, school is kind of their first testing ground to see how adults will react. Oftentimes, teachers are, a trusted teacher is one of the first people that they tell before their parents, <laughs> often. And so, um, and I know I read about um, kids who would, bring clothes to change at school because they don't want family to know. So they're one person at school and, um, you know, go home as who their parents, who their family understands them to be. Um, and uh, so school is supposed to be a safe space. Supposed to be a safe space because of, um, so, so I want uh, just a small anecdote. In when my kid was in tenth grade, we went to their open house, right? Like just meet the teachers, beginning of the year, and you know, so uh, yeah, my kid had just been had just come out for a few months at that point, and I just want to you know, I just want and and she was still struggling with you know mental health issues at times, so I just wanted to to make sure that's the teachers were aware, but I didn't out my kid to the teachers or anything. So the teachers didn't know that I knew, but one of the teachers out of her, out of her, um, uh, her desire to be an ally out of her, um, you know, wanting to show me that how much she wants to be an ally. She outed my kid to me, right? Like she was like, Oh, you know, but she, out of good intentions, <laughs> But she has no idea. I've never had an interaction with her. So she doesn't know that I'm not going to beat up my kid when I go home. I'm not going to kick her out. She doesn't know that. But out of her, like, you know, she, wanting to be an ally, she, she showed me um, the first piece of writing that, you know, my kid wrote. You know, it was just kind of write one paragraph, introduce yourself, well, you know, that kind of thing. And that was the first um, 
a first uh, year where my kid was slowly, gradually, socially transitioning, you know, telling a few people, but she wanted to show me that like, she changed her name on the, on the um, records, on her, on her records. And I'm like, okay, this is all great. This is wonderful. Thank you. But I'm just like feeling really unsettled because I'm like, are you doing this to other parent, other kids as well, to their parents who may not know, who may have a different reaction than, than I do. Um, so that is, that is why that policy is in place to protect kids. And so supporters of parents' rights want teachers who have an inkling that the child is questioning their identity. It must be reported to the parent. And if it is not reported, the teacher is somehow legally responsible for suppressing information. And this is a very big issue. I live in Burns Township, which is supposed to be a relatively liberal community. And there are two sets of people running for school board. One is for parents, what you think. When you interview these people in the paper, they're all for the best education for our children. Uh -huh. But when you go down to another left, it is parents' rights, mm -hmm. which is the distinguishing issue. And it is a very, it, uh, and so I would like to give a plug for Don Melanaski's uh, group, District for Democracy. You may remember he was the congressman that was defeated by Tom King Jr. And he has started, he decided he announced he would not run seek another uh, term in the House, but he started the Districts for Democracy, which is a group primarily involved in New Jersey, but does uh, with some national affiliation, specifically looking at uh, what should school boards be doing? And so they're primarily in library censorship mm -hmm. and uh, parents' rights. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, come out of it. If you can go to the website, you can find, and, well, and I get the question, the, the thing I'm on stress if, if you, we're, we're not in, in the midst of a school board election, check for your local district. Yeah. And if any, if there are more candidates than there are seats, which is most likely the case, there is probably, to some extent, this is the issue that is distinguishing mm -hmm. candidates and work very carefully to decide what specifically is the differentiation of the candidates they're running because uh, there is an excellent chance that yes. this is the issue. It is. It is. That is the defining issue in New Jersey elections this year. <laughs> so please pay attention. Um, if you go to New Jersey Project Chaos and Control slash, uh, there's a two 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 different same organization, two websites. Uh, one focus is specifically on running candidates, which is called the New Jersey Project, and they have their list of. Uh, endorse candidates. Now this, so this is what's happening, like, right? So like, first, you first go to the county, to your county, mm -hmm. then your school district, and uh, you will they will indicate if they are if they have made or, or, or groups that have made endorsements yeah. for candidates. So yeah, I just I mean this is book ban efforts. So the same people that are advocating for parents' rights are the same people that are showing up in school board meetings and um, advocating for banning of certain books and then, or suing their librarians for um, distributing pornography, which happened in North Counterton. And, and going <laughs> so, to board meetings of which they are not a member of speaking. Right, uh, right. So this is nationally across like, you know, um, one thing, there's the Houston, 28 schools, 28 schools eliminated their libraries and replaced them with discipline centers. Oh. And these are predominantly black, black and brown communities, schools. So that is what's happening now. Like they're not dealing with book bans. They're just actually dealing with, you know, direct like uh, school to prison pipeline, right? Like that's, that's what's happening now. So, um, 
Florida, Florida standard this year, they changed their um, African American history standard to actually reflect in their state standard <laughs> that um, when you're teaching about slavery, make sure to say that black people benefited from slavery because oh. it was useful. Uh -huh. It taught them useful skills. So, you know, I mean, but in New Jersey, we're dealing with book bans and um, the, the transgender policy because it's actually in place because that is not a policy that every state has. Um, so that's an easy thing for them to to go. So I'm I'm sorry. Uh, there, I know I know we're out of time. Um, I love to keep you know continue to to chat and um, uh, actually we're at the end of book ban week, <laughs> but um, but engage in that. But this has um, deep implications. Um, we'll just quick story, quick anecdote about Jax, Jackson Carey. Um, so if any of you have heard of the, um, uh, when book bands came to small town, New Jersey, it's a pod, uh, the daily New York times podcast. Um, he was a student at, uh, Voorhees in North Harden where book bands started in New Jersey. Um, and at 15, he was a student activist and, you know, really, um, uh, organized student response to the book bands. Um, and then, uh, he ran out of time. <laughs> um, and uh, I, so the first, his death anniversary, first death anniversary was just uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so, you know, I still think about him a lot, you know, because this is, this is the impact that, uh, I'm not saying that the book band caused it, but at 15, kids are really, already struggling with a lot. So we don't need to do this. <laughs> Um, so my, I think my challenge is, is you know, just for, for you all to think about what are your best practices here. Um, it's not a linear straight path. <laughs> um, trust each other. Keep having conversations. Um, recommendations. Um, there's so many resources. I'm sorry. I'm like working through this. <laughs> so, yeah. So feel free to connect and uh <laughs> Thank you for having me. We'll keep having these conversations. Thank you for being great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nora. And if you would send me these resources, I will share them yeah. with all of you so that yeah. you all have them as well. Yeah. So yeah. thank you all. And thank you for such a beautiful presentation. Thank you. Yes, we still have it. Oh, cool. 21. Bye, Mary. I don't know if you. I don't know if you're still on, but I'll see you later. She is. She's actually in. But thank you. Absolutely. I'm glad you came on. It was. It was fabulous. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I'll see you soon.